really mean. So, uh, and, and uh, all of you, are, of course, are more familiar with this than I am. But uh, the writers say that uh, while in feudal Europe uh, there started to be ideas of contractual relationship, uh, that in Japan uh, contract played no role in the feudal system. And the glue that held the feudal system together was instead the uh, family or kinship relationships uh, together with uh, Japanese notions of Neo-Confucianism. So we are starting from, from somewhat uh, different vantage points. And uh, in particular, the uh, uh, Japanese don't seem to have uh, focused on rights as something that uh, people had, and instead focused on obligation. Uh, and uh, the uh, rulers had an obligation to justly rule, but uh, the, the subjects didn't have rights that they could invoke against the ruler. And there was no formal legal system, uh, and uh, there seems to have been quite a bit of uh, pressure to uh, uh, resolve claims. People who had claims uh, got pressure themselves not to pursue them, and even their relatives got pressured to discourage their uh, uppity relative from pursuing their claim. So, so we're starting with this, uh, this hierarchical situation, and then, of course, uh, Commodore Perry arrives in 1853 with his black ships and um, uh, presents President Fillmore's letter to uh, uh, the Japanese emperor, and that leads to uh, some treaty relationships. Uh, but uh, from the Japanese perspective, of course, these were unequal treaties. And uh, Com Commodore Perry uh, approached this uh, demanding as a right the uh, uh, courtesies owed to, from, by one civilized nation to another, um, and uh, sort of introduced this idea that, that nations uh, had a hierarchical, or rather a horizontal relationship uh, as, uh, e as equals and not as uh, tributaries one to the other. So uh, this, this was a new idea uh, to Japan. Uh, the, 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 the concept of the law of nations or the family of nations was, was new to them. So, uh, so then after Perry arrives, we have uh, Consul General Townsend Harris, the American diplomat, who negotiates the 1858 treaty and he repeatedly, during these negotiations, invokes the law of nations and uh, makes it clear that the, the Japanese were obliged to accept this concept of the law of nations uh, as a, a prerequisite for um, satisfactory contact between the countries. And so Japanese authorities uh, did then try to master these, these concepts. Um, but, um, but before they really uh, had a chance to understand exactly what was happening. All these unequal treaties had been uh, sort of imposed upon Japan, and the the treaties, uh, uh, like the ones with China, uh, established consular jurisdiction, whereby um, Americans would be adjudicated by American courts uh, and so on, rather than Japanese courts, uh, which uh, did not go over well with the Japanese and and uh, various other advantages uh, to the Western powers were, were in these treaties. So uh, the Meiji Restoration then occurs in 1868, um, and uh, almost immediately the, uh, the Meiji government does say that it uh, will re respect the treaties that uh, it inherits um, and will conduct foreign relations according to the universal law of nations. Uh, or the, Japanese term is sometimes translated in different ways, the public law of the universe. But in any event, there's some ex acceptance of this idea that the, the Western concepts of, inter of international law uh, are uh, something they're going to buy into. And uh, they understand that if they're to become part of the family of nations, they have to develop a legal system that will uh, permit uh, uh, economic investment by other countries and will provide security for uh, foreign investors. Um, and they very much want to revise the unsatisfactory parts of the existing treaties, and so they are uh, determined to figure out what this law of nations concept that the Westerners use really means and how they can then use it to their advantage. So 
If we look at uh, international law from the Western perspective, the uh, key moments were uh, in uh, 1648 when we have the uh, Peace of Westphalia ending the, the Thirty Years' War. Uh, this was a very significant turning point because it's, a, it's the first time that, that the sovereign state system uh, is accepted uh, in, in Europe. Uh, the Thirty Years' War, of course, was a really terrible destructive war, one-fourth of the population of Germany was, was killed during that war. Um, and the, the Catholic countries were determined to voice their power over the Protestant countries and, and vice versa, and they wore themselves out and finally agreed that they would accept uh, the right of the Protestant countries to be Protestant and the right of the Catholic countries to be Catholic, and they would respect uh, national boundaries. And so that is where the, the sovereign state system, the idea of, of equal nations, um, emerges. And then uh, after the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s, we again have the Congress of Vienna where uh, some, some of these norms are, are uh, confirmed and strengthened uh, and some uh, new ideas uh, are uh, emerged. Uh, Switzerland is accepted as a, as a neutral country, which was important that you could, you could sort of uh, still be accepted as a country even though you didn't have allegiance to one of the other uh, factions. So, uh, so in, in the West, this idea of uh, state sovereignty is, is the starting point uh, for the international legal system, and it's a horizontal relationship. Big and small countries are equal in, in the sense that they have equal authority over their own um, borders and their own territory. And, and now, of course, we have 192 uh, states uh, in our sovereign state system. Um, international law was still uh, somewhat primitive uh, as of, of 1900, uh, but it was beginning to emerge, diplomatic immunity, uh, rights of aliens, uh, some ocean law, river law was being developed, and uh, principles on the use of force were also being developed uh, because the uh, Industrial Revolution had had made uh, weapons much more powerful and were causing uh, the ability to destroy each other uh, to be increased. Now, in contrast to this uh, horizontal sovereign state system uh, that was emerging in Europe, we have in Asia the, the Sinocentric system or the East Asian World Order, uh, which uh, uh, saw the, the Middle Kingdom of, of China at its apex and uh, um, seemed to, to dominate uh, thinking that there was this some kind of tributary relationship. Obviously, it was interpreted in different ways by different groups at different times, but it nonetheless uh, it was the system that seemed to be uh, in, in uh, operation in, uh, in Asia. So, uh, so Japan is uh, anxious to get away from this tributary system and uh, move into the family of nations that uh, it was being introduced to. And so Japanese scholars and officials were, were sent to, to Europe uh, and the West, and Western advisors came to Japan. Um, and uh, so Japan is, is trying to understand lots of legal systems, but international law is one of those, and uh, lots of uh, uh, international activities are, are going on at that time. Um, and uh, uh, the people of Japan were involved in this. Uh, there, there was this freedom of, and people's rights movement that, um, that emerged. Ueki Imori uh, wrote a series of essays that became very important, talking about the sovereign equality of states um, and respect for human rights, self-determination of people. So this, this, uh, these ideas were very much in circulation in Japan uh, during those periods. Now, this fellow, Henry Wheaton, played a, a role. He, was an interesting guy, was the reporter of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, early in his career, and then became a diplomat. And uh, in, in 1836 wrote one of the first uh, treatises on international law called Elements of International Law. Um, and that book was uh, translated into Chinese uh, in 1864 and uh, brought to Japan, read actively in Japan in its Chinese version, reprinted in Japan in 1865 in Chinese, and then finally in 1868 translated into Japanese. So this, this book uh, uh, played a significant role in uh, giving uh, Japanese scholars and officials insights into the Western uh, uh, international law. 
And then Theodore Woolsey, whose uh, statue is at Yale, you see in, these, uh, in this slide, uh, also uh, played a role, as, as did other scholars. Woolsey was a very interesting fellow. He was president of Yale for uh, 25 years and uh, uh, had studied theology as well as law and, uh, and wrote about Greek dramas and all kinds of things. And uh, during his uh, time, he, he wrote uh, books about uh, international law uh, that became very important. And uh, he and the other Western scholars were addressing this question of, well, um, where, where does international law, international law apply? And uh, the New World presented challenges. I mean, do the native people in the New Worlds have, have rights? Is it okay for us to just take their land? Or, uh, and it became clear that uh, Christianity played a big role in how Westerners were looking at international law and looking at the concept of civilized nations. Um, and we still see that term civilized nations in the uh, statute of the International Court of Justice. Uh, uh, I always, you know, my classes raise the question, well, what are the uncivilized nations and, uh, today, and uh, how do we identify them? And this, this was a matter of great uh, debate. Um, and, and Woolsey uh, linked being a civilized nation to being a Christian nation rather directly, and uh, had, uh, you know, statements that we would think of as politically incorrect these days, uh, where he asserted that the Christians were the first to elaborate a system of international law, for the same reasons that have enabled Christian states to reach a higher point of civilization than any other. Uh, so this seems a little embarrassing sometimes, but in any event, this was the, the dominant thinking uh, in the West. And um, the British scholar T.J. Lawrence, uh, who also wrote uh, some interesting treatises about international law, said, a certain degree of civilization is necessary, though it's difficult to define the exact amount. And then he's explaining that the king of Dahomey, which is uh, now Benin in West Africa, it would be uh, absurd to expect the king of Dahomey to establish a prize court or to require the dwarfs of the Central African forest to receive a permanent diplomatic mission. So they had uh, some outer perimeter of what they thought was civilized, but wasn't clear exactly what, uh, what you had to do to become civilized. But in any event, uh, Japan was determined to, to become civilized in this sense. And um, people characterize Japan's uh, activities as leaving Asia, entering Europe, um, and J Japan wanted to leave this East Asian world order and, uh, in fact, made efforts to, to destroy it uh, with military force. Uh, and so some people characterize the Meiji uh, policy as one, a double standard, uh, observance of Western international law, submissive attitude toward Western treaty powers, in order to enter the family of nations while having a, a rather high-handed and coercive attitude toward their, their Asian neighbors. And uh, you see Japan incorporating uh, Ryukyu uh, in the 1870s, uh, uh, doing their best uh, beginning in 1870 to, to separate Korea from uh, China's uh, sphere, uh, and then finally uh, defeating China in the uh, 1894-95 Sino-Japanese War, um, and in that treaty, of the Treaty of Shimonoseki, Ch China gives up its claim to have a special role in Korea and recognizes Korea as a, as a special independent state. So, uh, so Japan is uh, is doing its best to to end the East Asian world order while it's uh, negotiating with the West, and it and it is then eventually successful in renegotiating the unequal treaties. Uh, the 1894 uh, Anglo-Japanese Treaty of Commerce and Navigation is sort of the turning point um, and uh, signed just at the same time that the Sino-Japanese War begins. And it is an equal treaty that uh, ends the unequal treaty, recognizes reciprocal rights of uh, citizens of both countries to uh, travel and take up residency and engage in trade and navigation and, in, and so on. Um, so this was a, an important event, and, uh, and it uh, seemed like through this treaty and the ones that quickly followed, uh, Japan did enter into the, the family of nations and, and was accepted into the uh, uh, capitalist economy of the West. And in 1897, the Japanese Society of International Law is established.